If you're fairly new to guitar building, stick around. My guitar is done and I'm very happy with it. Despite all the attempts and the fancy editing, there were a few mistakes along the way which I chose to skip at the time. It's now time to take a look at those blunders and how I managed to get around them. As always, I'll be going step by step and with methods and tools you should be able to handle too. So stay with me, let's fix a guitar. Hi, I'm Yoav and this is the Electric Luthier. Today I'll be addressing some errors I've made while building the guitar. Guitar building incorporates many different techniques and there are different skills that need to be employed. Factories as well as smaller manufacturers have the process as well as all the tools and jigs all set up so they can be consistent but when learning and experimenting, we all make mistakes. This is even more true if you build a completely different guitar every single time. That's all fine, and as much as you hate it when it happens, it's part of the learning process, and the reason I want to share my own mishaps with you. I do have excuses for everything, but you're not gonna build a guitar with excuses. To make it interesting, there are different types of errors and blunders. I'll start with the side dots glue. If you're not going for intricate inlays, the side dots are usually pretty straightforward and require measuring, gentle drilling, a dab of glue, and some scraping and sanding after it's dried. This is usually done with any type of CR glue, also known as super glue because nobody wants to wait for the glue to dry. Since I happen to have been doing the side dots towards the end of the day, I know it'll be drying overnight at least, and decided to go with traditional carpenter's glue instead. Whenever possible, I prefer it for easier handling and cleanup. In retrospect, I know that carpenter's glue is not the best for plastic, even though it's great for wood. When I came back the next day and the glue was dry, I started cutting the excess bits sticking out. I used a small cutter and when I got to the ninth fret, the dot just pulled out with my upward cutting motion. The rest of them seemed okay, assuming no one will try to actively pull them out, so while cutting the rest with a knife instead of a cutter, I proceeded to glue the dot back. This time I used super glue. Only a small dab is needed at the hole and I quickly wipe the overflow with a dry rag so I'll have less to scrape or sand. By the time I tend to the other dots, it's dry and ready. Well, the lesson here is don't use carpenter's glue for plastic parts. This is different from the frets which brings me to the fretting mishaps. If you don't have a good fret press or prefer hammering the frets manually for any other reason, there are a few factors which can affect the success even if you're doing everything right. The fret slot needs to fit the thickness of the fret tang. That's obvious. But the same slot will act differently with woods of different density and will require a different amount of force to hammer the fret. You also need a hammer with enough weight to apply enough force and made from a material which will not damage the fret material. The glue is really the icing on the cake and should not be a critical factor for keeping the fret in its place. I was using a standard fret slotting saw, but this time with a slightly softer wood for the fretboard compared to the traditional rosewood. The fretting went well and I was using carpenter's glue because I knew I was going to do all the leveling and crowding only the next day. I did notice that there was one fret that wasn't sitting properly. I guess it was hit too hard and one of the tips started rising. 
more often than not, hammering on it to try and wield it into place will just make things worse. And there is no choice but to bite the bullet and just replace it. Remember the slight chamfer I did before slotting? This, with the decision to use carpenter's glue and not super glue, paid off. I can remove the fret without damaging the slot and with zero chipping. I fit a new fret in, gently hammer it in, and it's done. It gets some personal filing so the tips will be in line with the rest of the frets. When I finally came to attaching the neck to the body, which is one of my favorite milestones in the process, I noticed that the heel of the neck is just not sitting deep enough. I did measure twice before routing the pocket, but there it is, just too shallow. I check the height in relation to the bridge and see that it is indeed too high. Putting the template back on with masking tape and super glue is one of the last things I would want to do right now, but the only other option is manually chiseling away a couple of millimeters. Add to that the not so flat top I have now and well, you get it. On the other hand, the masking tape will actually protect the finish and routing off two millimeters or just a bit less than one sixteenth of an inch is really not that hard. After I attach the template and add some masking tape on the edge in case my alignment is slightly off, I use a shorter bit and I add a couple of more bearings to better and more comfortably match the depth I need. I even remember to hold it diagonally to not have the edge fall in. After I finish a little bit of chisel work I needed for cleanup of the pocket and it's ready for connecting the neck. The lesson here would be I guess measure measure and maybe once more before you cut. No actual harm was done, but I could have skipped this part. The neck fits perfectly, and I carefully clamp the neck, leaving room for two of the screws to be drilled and inserted. I do measure and drill. It's a very tight fit for the screws, and I decide to use a power screwdriver. It gets the first one in, and then... Snap! The second one breaks. Right, I forgot to use a bit of wax to ease the screw in. At this stage, there are two things I can do. If this was a, you know, customer's guitar, I would have tried to detach the neck and there's a good chance I could have unscrewed the broken screw. The part left in the body side of the connection doesn't have any threading on it, so I could pull them apart after removing the other screws. The other option is to just leave it and drill a second hole right next to it, making sure the washer covers the first hole. Since the position is not exactly parallel to the first screw anyway, it will not make a difference visually. I drill the second hole and this time use a bit of beeswax on the tip. It's a tight fit and I manually screw it all the way. The other two holes are drilled and screwed with no further hiccups. The lesson here is simple. If you don't have a more sensitive power tool, just hand screw it. And don't forget the wax. It makes a huge difference. This is even more true if you have screws of the cheaper kind. Now before I get to the rest of the mistakes, please take a moment and subscribe and maybe even hit the little bell to get notified when my next video comes out. I encourage you to comment or ask about anything in the comments below and I also welcome you to visit my website theelectricluthier.com with dozens of articles on guitar building. When it comes to installing the bridge I have a couple of nice mistakes I can only describe as well stupid and with a bit more attention and focus could have probably easily been avoided. The first has to do with thinking before drilling. After positioning the bridge in the right distance from the nut and in relation to the center line or more importantly the neck, I like to use the bridge itself as its own template. I mark the five holes for the screws 
and the six for the strings. The screw holes need to be drilled only as deep as the screws go. In my enthusiasm, I jumped in and drilled the first and last holes of the screws all the way through. The holes for the strings should be drilled all the way to the other side. Unless you have an accurate drill press, there's a good chance they will not come out the other side in a straight line. Therefore, I only drill the first and last holes all the way and then again use the bridge itself to mark and drill the holes for the furrows in the back. To make the little drilling mistake worse, I also failed to give support to the back and I chipped the unnecessary holes coming out the back. Now I'll have to glue a piece back with super glue instead of just covering a one millimeter hole. After attaching the bridge using a bit of wax on the screws and as I get ready to assemble the pickups, I realize I forgot to ground the bridge. So I now have to detach the bridge. I want to drill diagonally from the underside of the bridge to the bridge pickup cavity. I then thread a wire with the tip exposed. I even scuff the paint on the back of the bridge for better conductivity. I make sure it's in place and screw the bridge back on. These are the kind of mistake which are not a big deal and are just unnecessarily time consuming. First time branding is exciting and although I've made numerous texts on scraps of wood, I still manage to fail on the first attempt of the headstock branding. Uneven pressure is all it takes, and then it's back to sanding and re-preparing the surface for a second attempt. Luckily, the second one went well. My pickups came with a tapered frame to match a curved top that resembles a Les Paul. I had a pair of nice black aluminum frames that should have been a perfect fit. I've checked the pickups themselves multiple times but failed to replace the frames ahead of time and only found out they were too small when trying to install them. I could either file them to the right size or sand the originals to be flat. I chose the latter and after a few minutes on the sanding disc and hand file they were as good as new and sitting nice and flush on the body. Another little fail, which even made me laugh as it happened, and goes to show how we often go into auto mode. My true oil bottle had a tiny hole in the cover, which made it very convenient to extract small quantities of oil. In fact, it was so small that the semi-dried oil clogged it. I pushed on it with my finger and made the hole much bigger. On the first attempt, I was aware of it and carefully oiled the cloth. In the second attempt, however, I made the automatic motion and splashed probably three or four times the amount that I actually needed. No harm was eventually done as I spread it on the body and neck evenly, but the lesson here is to try and make more conscious motions and not drift into auto mode. Until you become a real pro, you can't really afford to do that. I hope you enjoyed my mistakes. With a bit of luck, you'll be able to avoid my mistakes and go on and make your own. On my next video, I'll be doing a full setup and maybe even a demo. It's not always enough to be good looking. The guitar that is. If you want to know when that's coming, Hit the subscribe button below and don't forget the little bell to get notified. I also welcome you to come and visit my website theelectricluthier.com with plenty of more information and articles on guitar building. But don't just watch it and read it, go build a guitar!